My title tonight is Fight For It. And I was really impressed with this um, this week and have been studying on the subject of fighting. Uh, actually, been pondering for some time on the subject of fighting. A lot of the inspiration is just how, how much we seem, we know we're engaged in a fight and it seems sometimes we get turned around in the battle and we find ourselves facing one another in face, instead of the true enemy. Um, I wanted just to share this in a way to encourage you. This may be a part one, uh, but the title is Fight For It, and we're just going to encourage you to be fighting for the right things. If you look at verse 8, I want to start here and just kind of travel with me on this thought. It says, a time to love and a time to hate, and that's a those two have comparisons one to another and are opposites, and we understand this one maybe better than the one before, a time of war and a time of, of peace. It's interesting that we often engage in war for peace. We actually fight to have peace. But a time of war, it's a time to fight. It's a time to do battle. It means to make war. First time that this word is actually used in the scripture, I believe, is Genesis chapter 14 and the battle of the kings there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and that's the first time this is kind of this whole idea of warfare and doing battle and fighting. That's what a time of war is. And then there's a time of peace. You could kind of give whatever definition you want to that, but it would be tranquility, time of rest and accord where everyone is happy dwelling together. And this uh, verse, kind of what leads to this verse is a number of different comparisons. Each one, you could break them down and spend a lot of time just considering it. But it says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I think it's easy for all of us tonight just as human beings. If we didn't even put it in the context of the word of God, it's easy for us to accept that there are times and there are seasons. We look at nature, there are seasons, and we see the different seasons in nature and we can explain them. Well, it's this way because of the, uh, the earth and the relationship to the sun. And we know that there's times and seasons to everything. So it's easy for us to accept times of life and seasons, but it's not always easy to know when each season is. We can say um, fall season. Well, you just look at the calendar. You look at the temperature, uh, but it's not always easy to discern a time to love and a time to hate. It's not always easy to know when there's a time of war and when a time of peace is. Would you agree? You say, well, there's a time to cast away and there's a time to gather. Well, when is it? It's a time to, there's a time to rip and there's a time to sow. We could accept that there's times for ripping and a time for sowing, but knowing just exactly when to do it isn't always as easy as just saying, well, there's a time for it. It reminds me of uh, some counsel that Sister Biscoe gave Sister Elizabeth uh, years ago, and she's two things she said that always to remember, it's just a phase and it doesn't really matter. And I think it was in relation to raising up children. You know, it's just a phase, and it doesn't really matter. And there's a lot of things that happen, and we can get all worked up, and we say, it doesn't really matter. And there's times when things are happening, and say, well, it's just a phase. And I remember shortly after that, it's kind of a long story, but I'll just keep it short and get to the punchline. Brother Tim Dodd didn't get us to the airport on time, and I was a little bit upset uh, that we were going to miss our flight because there was a line out the door in Grand Prairie, Alberta, of all places. And, and I was kind of seething a little bit that I was going to miss my flight. And Elizabeth told me, she said, honey, it doesn't really matter. And I clenched my teeth and said, don't worry, it's just a phase. <laughs> and so there's, that's the challenge, right, is to know when is which and how do they all apply. In Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 11, it says, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. This is a clear uh, prescription for war. Prepare war. Let all the men of war draw near. And this is how, this is how uh, uh, important this warfare is. Take the very things that you use to plow up your fields, to give you crops, to feed your family. Turn your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears, because now every resource needs to be made available to fight. Symbol yourselves, come together, and, and cause the mighty ones to come down to the Lord. And this is a declaration of warfare to turn plowshares into swords, pruning hooks into spears. But then in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, and it says, And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. On one hand, we're being told to turn our plowshares into swords and then our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks and our pruning hooks into spears. It means there's a time for war, 
but then there's also a time for peace. We may be able to place these scriptures appropriately in the time and season that they would exist within the, uh, the continuity of God's word and the millennium and the time of war for the believer. But it's just used to give an example. The very same instrument that you might use to plow up the field may need to be turned into a sword. But then that very thing that's used as a sword may need to be turned into a plowshare. In Hebrews chapter 7, part 1, this will be... A very important quote just to grab a hold of and don't let it slip your mind tonight as we minister. Brother Branham says, now all wars are fought for principles. This is what he said. All wars are fought for principles. Now, every fight, every battle, every engagement has some justification. All wars are fought for principles. There's a reason. That's why we have the saying, pick your battles. Uh, choose which mountain you want to die on. What principles are you choosing to die for? What's, the, what's your reason for engaging in conflict? Because he says all wars have some underlying justification, or as he says here, fought for principles. Now, this is a very interesting statement. Now, if you have a little war in church, it must be the right principle. For those of you visiting, don't try to read into that. If anything, we're in the honeymoon phase of our church, just a cream of the crop, wonderful atmosphere and progress. People ask, how's the church doing? And I always say God is being very gracious to us. But here's an interesting statement where Brother Man says, if you have a little war in church, you could go back and kind of catch the full context during that season. He says, if you have a little war in church, it must be the right principle. You must be fighting for the right thing. And each member of the church is supposed to do that. So if there's going to be a fight, make sure you're fighting for the right thing. If there's going to be a war, and he's seeming to suggest that you can have little wars in church, but you must be warring for the right thing, he says it must be the right principle. In other words, don't declare war over something that's not worth fighting for. Don't I drive down a stake and I'm going to die on this mountain and I'm going to choose as some people, even, I'm even reminded now that some people stake their relationship with other believers and even seemingly their testimony on whether or not they were going to wear a mask or whether or not they're going to be socially distanced and people just chose that mountain to die on. Didn't plan on saying that, but maybe it's not too soon to say it. But he says, if you have a little war in church, it must be the right principle. Be sure that what gets your gander up, what you roll up your sleeves for, what you find that you want to start standing for, are the right kind of principles because he says you must be fighting for the right thing. In saying what he is suggesting, at least giving, uh, acknowledging that there's times when you do fight. And I would say this is a large, uh, this is a large subject. This is the paradox of faith. And one thing to think about when we say the faith or faith, think of the Christian life. There's so much that's assumed in that. But it's the paradox of the Christian life. It's the paradox of our faith. We're both fighting and resting. We find ourselves in two states at the same time, it seems. And it's uh, not Schrodinger's cat necessarily, but it's by observation that you determine whether or not the person is engaged in battle or whether or not the person is resting. But it is a paradox of the believer that we are both trusting and believing and resting, but at the same time fighting. Uh, just to redeem Brother Tim Dodd, he uh, got me late to the airport, but he said something one time to me that's never left me and upheld me through many difficult things. As he says, faith has to have something against it. If, if there's nothing opposing it, then is it really faith? If it's so evident to the senses, if it's so manifestly declared to what's observable, then how is it faith? But faith has to have something contrary, has to have a voice of criticism, it has to have some sort of contravening story or some other something else working against it and fighting. Otherwise, how can we even be sure that we're standing on faith alone? And so faith sometimes, in order to be faith, has to have opposition or things that declare it to be false. What a paradox. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 to 11, I choose to share this just to get our minds thinking on the promise of rest. It says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, laboring to rest. Even in that, there seems to be a paradox. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Rest is such a large theme in Scripture. We could use the, uh, the, the word trusting. I'm confident. We could use so many different Scriptures to, uh, to lift this up. We talk about 
The lily, Jesus says, the lilies don't toil. But it just, uh, taking no thought is then the example that we gather from that. Lilies don't toil, they don't strive, they don't fight. Uh, they just seem to uh, come into their radiant glory because God is looking out after them. And then, so we're told to rest in the same manner that a, a lily would, that just trust in God and the nature that He's given us by the new birth, that it's just going to produce what it ought to, and that He knows we need to eat, we know we need to drink, we need to be clothed, and that God will provide all those things. So there's a rest for the believer when they come into that place of faith where it says, I'm resting, I'm trusting. Why aren't you worried? Why aren't you striving? Why aren't you doing all sorts of things? Uh, I'm just trusting God. I'm just believing. But that doesn't push us over into the wrong kind of laziness. And uh, I don't provide for my family. I don't work. Brother Aaron, why don't you have a job? Why aren't you paying the bills? God will provide. And so there's, a, there's something to it to where it's not always just the carnal idea. Or it's not always to this nth degree. And even in resting I believe that Paul teaching this rest that's to the believer, he still writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Thou therefore endure hardness. I wonder if uh, Timothy, maybe having heard Paul preach on rest, and the believers entered into rest, and Timothy says, yes, I'm resting, I'm resting. And then Paul says, endure hardness. And he says, Let's talk to me about the rest a little bit more. Preacher, preach me happy. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So this is applicable not just to Timothy and his calling, but it's applicable to all of us as believers, the image of being a soldier. Uh, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. We're to endure hardness as a good soldier. And this is no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a good soldier. Now, Paul seems to be going more, leaning really far into this analogy of being a soldier. And it's because it's still applicable to Timothy in his office, in his ministry, in his calling, in his position as a Christian. He has been chosen to be a good soldier. Therefore, he's going to be warring. And if you're warring, you do not entangle yourself with the affairs of this life, that you may please Christ who's chosen you to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. So there is a direct, this is, this is, I wouldn't even say an implication. This is just a very clear uh, prescription that the believer is going to strive. The believer is going to have to endure. The believer is going to have to war because he's been chosen to be a soldier. Amen. And the sermon of thinking man's filter, again, this is another one to join with that Hebrews chapter 7 part 1. All wars are fought for principles. You must be fighting for the right thing. This would be the real gut check, uh, the real cornerstone of what's burdened my heart. He says, now, let us all tonight check our desires. And then you can see what kind of filter you've been drawing through. Thinking man's filter. He's talking about whether or not you're drawing it through the word. And if I could caution all of us, I would say, here we are. Uh, if you're here on church on Wednesday nights, we can pat ourselves on the back. I've said this before, uh, that if you come to church on Sunday morning, you love church. If you come on Sunday evening, you love your pastor. And that's why we don't have an evening service on Sundays. And then they say, if you come on Wednesday night, you love the Word. And so I trust that that's what's in your heart. You love the Word of God. You love the things of God. This is something that's very real to your heart. And that's just a saying. That's not a doctrine or a principle we go by. But I would want us all to not necessarily immediately begin to think about the filter being the world and religion and denominations and Trinitarianism and the days of miracles are past. But just there's ways that our filter, the word, can get gummed up with other things. And, and maybe we're not drawing everything through. Everything's not getting through as it ought to or it's presenting to us an incomplete picture. So we're checking ourselves tonight. And he says, check to see what kind of filter you've been drawing through. Let's check each one of us here and out across the nation Check your desires and what you really want in life. I like that. There's a, there's a gut check time maybe as a sinner, as a young person, when you come to God and you drive a stake down and you know your life's been changed and that filter's been rearranged. You begin to live your life for a while as a believer and you know you're a born-again Christian. You're serving God. You're making difficult decisions. Your life's completely changed. You find yourself uh, serving God in church, doing things that you otherwise would have never done had God not changed your life. But through the passage of time, things can kind of just slip a little bit and you're, you're, you're filtering much more than you thought you were and it's time to check yourself and ask, 
ask, what do I really want in life? And is what I'm trending to and aspiring, uh, what I say I want, is what I'm doing really leading me to achieve what I really want? And then he says, check what you are fighting for. Because there's such a wrestling, such a struggle, such a fight sometimes in life. Things that we fight for, things that we're very adamant about, things that we want, things that we don't want, things that we strive to maintain, certain appearances that we try to keep up, certain platitudes that we try to bolster, or even things in our lives that we're striving and fighting against and fighting for and trying to keep or trying to figure out. And maybe we just need to take a step back and say, why are you fighting? Why are you even fighting for this? Why are you even struggling? Check what you're fighting for. Check what you are here for. Check what you go to church for. And he says, what makes you? He says, it's good to go to church, but just don't go to church only. That won't save you. Just check a few minutes. Say, is my objective, what kind of filter am I drawing through anyhow? I think it's a good question for all of us. I would say that based upon the things I'm going to share tonight, and so I'm saying this at the outset, uh, is not self-serving, but it, it's, it's pointing to what I'm going to be uh, addressing or, or just supporting through scriptures. We're all fighting, but what are we fighting for? On some level, there's some striving, there's some hardness we're enduring, there's some difficulty that we're undergoing, and it's a good idea sometimes to have a little bit of a gut check and ask ourselves, why am I fighting? There's a principle that we could tap into as believers to realize that we are given a task to do and we have a job to do. And a job is always going to be difficult. It's always going to be hard. There's always going to be things that we need to be doing. And as long as we're in our position doing what we ought to do with the hammer in our hands, then that there, there's a work to do and there's a hardness that comes with it. There's a callousness that comes with working in the gospel, working as a Christian, doing the things that we ought to do. But then there's always a voice down in the valley of Ono. Oh no. Right? We're drawn from the book of Nehemiah. They're saying, hey, why don't you come fight, why don't you come fight us in the valley? Why don't you come fight us in, in the plains here and come away from the job that you have to do and put down your hammer and come fight or talk with us in the valley? And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do is put down your hammer to get into a fight. And so if you're fighting, you need to ask yourself whether or not you're fighting with a sword in one hand and a hammer in another because you're on the wall doing what you ought to do or whether or not you've been called away from where you should be and you find yourself fighting and struggling because you're not along the wall doing the work you should be doing. I wish I could, would have maybe give, could give more attention to that tonight, but I, there's so many more principles, but keep that in mind. That you're working, you have a job to do, and if you're fighting, are you fighting because you're doing your job, or are you fighting because you've left it? Because if you fight while you're doing the job, God said, that's my battle. He's promised you he'll keep you. He's promised you he'll fight your battles. If you're fighting while you're alongside the wall, then that's when you hear the sound of the trumpet and those that come to your aid and defend you. And you'll find that God will fight those battles. But if you've left your position to run out and start a fight, God may be saying, I didn't pick that fight. You're on your own. And you don't need to try to win the fight or save face. Leave it. Just leave it. You don't need any bragging rights. You don't need, I beat the devil on his own ground. No, 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 no. You think you won. You've actually lost. Get away from it. There's no pride in this. You're not owning that battle. Just admit it that you're not where you should be. And just don't try to save face or make yourself look good. Just come right back where you know you ought to be. Do what you know is right as a Christian. And leave the fight and come back and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I got myself. I picked a fight with the devil. And I was writing checks that I couldn't cash. And I'm sorry. Here, I'm back. Ask yourself, what principles are we fighting for? What stand? What am I standing for? And I'm doing everything I can to stand. And I find it really, really hard to stand. And as it gets harder and harder to stand, ask yourself, where am I standing? What is this all about? Now, I'm not suggesting that you'll find that you're not where you should be. But when you do that and it's gut check time, you find, I know I'm right where I belong. As he said, you must be fighting for the right thing. And we check what you're fighting for. There's a point at which you realize, yes, the battle's always going to be hot and heavy in this. The there's always going to be a labor and a warfare when I'm doing what's right for God. And you can stand strong. In Revelation chapter 12, we're kind of going all the way back to the beginning, before the beginning, to see just how much there is a warfare. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, it says, And there was a war in heaven. Brother Bram says in the fourth seal, first thing in heaven was a battle. 
And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And Brother Branham said the first thing in heaven was a battle. Lucifer was kicked out and come to earth. Then he polluted Eden. Then he's been polluting ever since. So he, the same uh, devil who fought in heaven. There wasn't a warrior in heaven then kicked down to earth and found his, uh, his peaceful genes. No, he comes down to earth and he's been polluting and been fighting and been warring, been warring ever since. So no matter where you're born in time, you're born into a war. No matter what point in life you find yourself existing, as long as you're here on earth in these dimensions, it's a dimension of warfare and striving and fighting. In the battle, excuse me, in the sermon, the world is falling apart. Verbib says, in our political world today and our religious world is just exactly like it was in the days of the first coming of the Messiah. It's polluted. Why? Because Satan's been doing his job. Kicked out of, first thing was a battle in heaven, kicked down to earth, and he's been polluting ever since. The whole system is rotten. Our politics, it could get no worse. And our religion, I don't see how it can get any worse than what it is now. The whole thing is corrupted. Our political world, man-made systems and fashions, we want everything, just everything so we can take it easy and retire and take life easy. Maybe an interesting transition from the rottenness of politics and man-made systems and fashions and everything's polluted. But then he immediately says, we want to take it easy and retire and take life easy. Amen. I mean, right? I mean, who here, who here is saying, no, I don't ever want to retire. I don't want to take it easy. Okay, just make enough for the rest of us and maybe we can. But this is, seems to be the ambition. I want to take it easy, retire, take life easy. Life wasn't intended to be easy. Life is a struggle. And I love this. Anything that's got life is, str- is a struggling. This could be a little bit of encouragement to you as we'll touch on here in a little bit, that if you don't have life, there's no fight. If there's not some other desire that's been awakened inside of you to want to see the goodness of God, to have every promise that He's given to you, or to have a greater peace, or to have more out of the Word of God, if you've got life in you, then there's got to be a struggle. He says, look at the trees, how they struggle. Look at everything that's got life. It's a struggle. And when we try to get some kind of system that takes it easy, then we are wrong, and we know there's something wrong. There is no way that we could ever structure church and our doctrines and our belief systems to just make life easy on a Christian. The only way that we could do that would be to delude you, to deceive you, and to make you think that everything's fine. But that would be the worst kind of wake-up call whenever the the illusion is lost, whenever the mirage is finally recognized. I've been chasing after the wrong thing. Anything that has life is struggling. What is it struggling for? To live. It's struggling, it's uh, it's, overcoming, it's to keep life in you. There's something that you're fighting for, something that you're struggling for. Ask yourself, in the fight, in the the battle, in the struggle, is it to live or am I actually actually working against life? 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. Fight. The good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Lay hold, seize upon, grasp, do not let go. To lay hold on eternal life, to seize it, is, there's almost some um, aggressiveness to it, some intent. I'm not just touching it. I'm not just uh, I'm near it, but I'm laying a hold of it. I'm going to have it in my grasp, and I'm not going to let it go. This is something that you cannot wrest away from me. This is something that I, I, I find no cause or reason to let go of. And then it says, fight the good fight of faith. One, uh, I read in one place where it says, agonize the good agony. There's different takes on this scripture that, would not want to use the terms fight or good fight, but it's very plain in the way that Paul meant it. Whether they would argue that it's just by type or or just by way of analogy, but it means fight, conquer, seize the prize, fight the good fight. 
As Brother Branham said that there could have a little war in the church, so you must be riding, fighting the, must be the right principle. You must be fighting for the right thing. Paul's saying, if you're going to fight, fight for the right thing. Fight the good fight of faith. So there is a fight of faith, which is the good one. If it's not a faith, then it's the wrong one. You could be fighting, but if it's not the fight, uh, uh, the good fight of faith, then it's the wrong fight or the bad fight of not faith, or the bad fight of unbelief, and you could get your knuckles bloody, and you could wear yourself out, and you get pretty exhausted, and you might feel like you've done something, but you're in the wrong fight. So he says, agonize the good agony. Be, uh, don't be weary in well-doing. If you suffer for good's sake, think of all the scriptures that tell us that even when we're doing good and even when we're doing right, there's a cost, there's a tax, there's something that can happen to the individual. So be sure that if you're spending, be sure that if you're being spent, be sure that if there's some loss, you're doing it for something that is the ultimate gain and you're not throwing everything away for something that's not worth it. Amen. Paul could come to the end of his ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. The Christian life is a fight. Strife against sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Even though our present dominion are over those things we find to have dominion, there's a fight. We have a fight with earth and hell while we're on earth. Might seem to be peculiar to think of it that way, but the Christian life, having received the Holy Ghost, is still a fight. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and speaking of Christ and what he's done for us, and such uh, a beautiful picture, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What, what, what a beautiful sounding place to be. We've been raised up to sit together. Where are you sitting? In heavenly places. Right In heavenly places, we could just hear the heart playing. We feel the, the gentle breeze. We, we get a vision of paradise and all the luxuries and all the amenities and at least all the spiritual benefits that come with heaven. Yes, we've been raised up, seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus on the right hand of power. We, we could see all these things that come with that image of being raised up, right? Raised up into heavenly places. But this isn't a place to sit and ease around. We're not elevated to relax, but elevated to fight. There's, there's to be raised up, to be seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's actually, you could say it in this way, and you'll see it may be brought out by Brother Branham uh, to a better degree here in a moment, that beforehand, there's no fight. Hey, you're just going with the world. Wherever the world wants to take you, you, go, you, might, you might act like you're fighting, but there's really no fight. But now that you've been raised up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, it's a promotion to the boxing ring. It's a promotion to an arena of fighting. Because Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 6. Remember this, the image, I've been raised up. Now in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Oh, but you forgot, Paul. I've been raised up into heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I, I put my armor down. Did I sound like Joel Osteen? I'm not using it anymore. Right? But no, you put your whole armor on that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle. We wrestle. This is a place of resting. This is a place of fighting. This is a place of struggling. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You've been raised up to fight spiritual weakness in high places. If you could have just stayed down here, you would have never had to fight. But you've been raised up to a place of warfare, a place of battle. Wherefore, because you've been raised up and now you're in this arena at the right hand of power. This is a place where God is conquering, a place where God is going to have dominion, a place where God is going to drive away every fear, every doubt and every imperfection in your life. Then you have to ready yourself for the for the battle. And now you take unto yourself the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And we stand, therefore, and then he goes through the description of the believer's armor. So you've been raised up, but you've actually been raised up to the battlefield. A place of warfare. Brother Branham in the sermon, Doors in Door, he says, I like a man of vision. He's talking about Abraham Lincoln. 
She says, I like people that's got something they're fighting for. Just not just lay around. Well, ever what comes along will be all right. Can we think about that for just a moment? Just whatever comes along will be all right. How many times have we translated faith to be that? Well, just whatever happens, happens. I'll just take it as it comes. And there's a point at which that's not faith. You just don't care. That's not faith. You don't have enough faith to fight. You're not just willing to accept any outcome. You're actually in doubt that God will fight your battle. So you're afraid to take a stand. Listen, I'm not trying to be mean to you and you came all the way out here for church tonight. I want you to gut check and think about it. That there's got to come a point where you want it enough to fight for it. And not just like, well, I guess it doesn't really matter. Well, let's just take that to the nth degree. Okay, let's just say, well, whatever matters. I don't care if I'm saved or not. Well, well, it it doesn't really matter if my wife loves me. It doesn't really matter if my children serve God. Well, whatever happens, let's just go ahead and take that and run it through to the nth degree and find out that there is an attitude that's more indicative of fear or just spiritual laziness than it is faith. Because he says, I like people that have something to fight for and just don't lay around and just take whatever comes. He says, oh, be up and at it. And Lincoln never did let his education stand in the way. He had to do something. I think every Christian ought to be that way. Find your purpose and go do it. This attitude that we seem to take sometimes, I think it's a real real challenge to our young people in the message because we hear about election and predestination, so they get to the point where they think they understand it enough to say, well, if I'm elected to it, it's just going to happen. Yep, I guess, I mean, I can't save myself. I can't get the Holy Ghost myself. If it's just going to happen, it's going to happen. Well, you you can choose just how bad it's going to be for you to come. You may not have any choice in being a son of God, but you can have a choice over how uh, uh, of things in your life. And he says there's got to come a point where you're willing to fight for it. That if you really believe it and you really want it, say, no, God, if you don't come, you're going to find a bag of bones here. Not come up to the altar and say, well, I guess if you're going to give it to me, you'll give it to me. Five, four, three, two, one. Nope, didn't get it. And go sit down. Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So he says, strive to enter. This is a labor fervently. There's no ho-hum to us. Contend. Struggle. To enter, fight to enter, strive to enter at the straight gate. For many will say unto you, many I say will seek to enter in and shall not be able. They'll seek, but do they strive? We we, we kind of maybe have a little bit of a joke in the house that if something's lost, we'll say, did you look for it? And they'll say, yeah, we looked for it. And then you find it. It's just right out in the open. So we just kind of say, yeah, you looked for it, right? You just kind of glance. But did you, you may say you sought it, but did you strive, labor fervently? Why? Because we have to fight the good fight of faith. I like people that's got something they're fighting for. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, I cut this slide down a little bit. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We may walk in the flesh, and as you walk in the flesh, you may never uh, go to boot camp. You never may enlist in the armed services. You may never actually get in a a fight where you're throwing fists. You may may never catch hands in a grocery store. But you war. Even though it may not be after the flesh, you will war. And he says, the weapons of our warfare, we may walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. This warfare that we are entered into may not be a war of words. It may not be a war of hands, but is a warfare. And in this warfare, striving with spiritual things and ideologies and, and, and uh, things that may not be seen. We have weapons in this warfare that are powerful and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's a lot that you could take from that in this fighting the good fight of faith. But I just make reference to show you that the scripture is very clear. We war. We fight. Amen. Brother Bram's asked the question in question and answers in 61. This is question 165. He says, is it possible for a Holy Ghost filled person to be driven to do minor things, influenced to do minor things that he doesn't want to do? Anybody want to take a shot at this one? It's a very interesting question. I like the way that it's written. 
Is it possible for a Holy Ghost-filled person to be driven to do minor things that he doesn't want to do? You know the answer. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> He's just making sure he catches everybody. Like, right? You know, just the, the adults. Oh, yes. The formal. Yes, sir. And then the young people. Yeah. <laughs> right? We're all kind of caught in this. Oh, yes, yes, sir, yeah, a Holy Ghost-filled person. You are right in the place to be drove by those things. This is not for justification. This is for for liberation. This is that we would not be in bondage. He says, you just put yourself up a target. We're we're moving very quickly towards the close tonight. So if you came to get something, you haven't got anything yet, time to maybe enter in. And just uh, really uh, go ahead and fight for this service at this very moment. It says, you're right in the place to be drove by these things. You just put yourself up a target. When you're down there serving the devil, he just lets you slouch around any way you want to. You thought he was pushing you, driving you, and beating you up to do it. No, he was letting you do whatever you wanted to do. But once you take a stand for Christ, you've gone on the other side then. He trains every gun right around on you. Every temptation, everything that could be thrown to you, then you got it. But what have you got? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Notice how beautifully he puts this. Now, you weren't in the battle here. You was just slopping along. I know you thought when you were in the world, man, I was just really fighting. I was just really struggling. You know what you're fighting against? Your election. I was really fighting. I was really struggling, man. I was really striving. and I was just, no, you were, the devil's doing whatever he wanted to you. Or you were just doing whatever you wanted. Who, what you were fighting against is not the devil, but the very call of God in your life. This is something that young people sometimes need to take a step back and recognize. I say young people, but even us as adults, we're fighting with a decision. We're fighting with something we know. We're fighting something we don't know. And we really got our fist up and we're really fighting. We're really struggling. And we think we're giving the devil a black eye. And we're actually wrestling against the will of God and wrestling against the call of God and wrestling against the very thing we know we ought to do. He says, you weren't in a battle here. You were just slopping along. But now you've cleaned up. You've dressed up. You've shaved. You've combed your hair. you put on a uniform. It's in a spiritual sense. You've got a gun in your hand. There's a lot of us Republicans that like that. <laughs> he says, let's go. You are in battle not to show off but to fight, fight. Sure, when the temptations rise with the spirit and the shield of faith, buckle off and move on. That's right. Oh, put on the whole armor of God. He says, why do you put on armor if you're not going to fight? All soldiers are dressed to fight, not to show off. Did I get the... Okay, when I was putting this quote in, it was so long, I think I was afraid I chopped it up. Why do you put on armor if you're not going to fight? All soldiers are dressed to fight, not to show off. Walk out and say, I'm so-and-so. Sounds like that condescending cactus. I'm so-and-so. Now I'm a Christian. See who I am. I belong to so-and-so. Hallelujah. I got the Holy Ghost the other night. Sure, nothing bothers me anymore. Oh, brother, I believe you better go back and try again. Oh, I'm telling you, when as soon as you say you got the Holy Ghost, Satan's got every gun right on you shooting you. Then you got the whole armor on. Then you take the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit of the word, and shod yourself with the gospel and take the old middle piece here, the breastplate, and pull pull up the cinch on it and tighten yourself up a little bit and get ready for it because it's a coming. Don't you worry. Yes, sir. You're going to have plenty of trouble. But remember, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You're in a battle not to show up but to fight. When we entered the body of Christ, you were called to fight. Called to fight, not faint. We know that entering in the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a type of the promised land. In Numbers chapter 33, verses 52 and 53, he says, this is God now speaking to the children of Israel. They're going to be entering entering into the land of milk and honey. Right? They're going to be entering into home but they'd have to fight for it. 
Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. Did God not say that he would drive them out from before them? But who was God going to use to drive them out from before them? Them. And they were going to drive out all the inhabitants, destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, quite pluck down all their high places, and dispossess the inhabitants of the land. They were going to have to put footsteps to the promise. They weren't going to be able to just sit outside the promised land and kind of peek around and just wait for God to drive them all out. But they were going to have to step forward. And as they step forward, because God said, look, I'm not going to drive them all out at once. But as you grow and increase and you exhibit the maturity and the fortitude and the perseverance to claim every promise, then I'll push them out. But if you only come in so far and you don't make a step to possess every inch, they're going to they're going to stay right there. But as soon as you make an affirmative step of faith that that's my land, I'm going to possess it. Your act of faith, God would go before you and drive them out. But if you're just sitting there waiting. Waiting for something to happen. It's never going to happen. Oh, I guess just whatever happens, happens. No, you have to fight for it. It was home, but they'd have to fight for it. Brother Branham in question and answers in 59 says, Canaan is not a type of the millennium because they had wars, fightings, killings, and everything else in Canaan. So you've been raised up, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But now that you've been raised up, you can do battle with spiritual wickedness in high places. They're not looking down on you, but you can see them eye to eye through the word. He says that type, the holy Canaan is a type of the Holy Ghost. Egypt's the world that they come out of. The wilderness is where they were sanctified, called out church. Canaan is where they settled down with the Holy Spirit because they still had wars. Anybody that says they got the Holy Ghost and nothing bothers them anymore, he says, you better go back and try again. Isn't that scary? To think that you've had some experience where nothing bothers you anymore and it's the wrong one? That's something to think about. They still have wars. And if you don't believe, and if you don't believe you have wars, just get the Holy Spirit once. What are you doing? What do they do in Canaan? They were possessing their rights. They were possessing their rights and they could not possess their rights till they got into Canaan. They didn't own nothing in the wilderness. All the confession, all the, it's our land, it's our land, it's our land. All the promises, every promise in the book is mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. They didn't own, they didn't own nothing in the wilderness. Then when you come into Canaan, they had rights. Then they had rights and we've got rights. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you are in Canaan. You have to fight for it. Every inch of ground, you have to fight for it. That's what you have to do. Don't stand on the sidelines. Don't stand on the outside of the arena just asking God to do it for you and do this and do that. There's got to be something in your heart that tells you, I need to step forward in faith, believing, knowing that greater is he that is in me. Don't meet the devil on his ground. Don't run after something and fight for something that's not worth fighting for. But if you can recognize the promise of God, it's worth it to face it and step forward into it. I know that mature believers can accept this. I hope you can catch catch it in the right spirit. If If you're going to be in a war fighting over some principle, make sure it's the right thing. And he says, if you don't believe there's wars, get the Holy Ghost one time. He says, then you have to fight for it. If I could even say this, I know this maybe it opens up a large thought. But you have to surrender to get the Holy Ghost, right? This is, again, it's the paradox. Seek him with your whole heart, then you'll find him. But there's a surrender and there's a dying out. There's a letting go to get it. And then once you get it, you're raised up to fight. But now greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Brother Bram said a real Christian fights for his position. He has to stand alone, him and God, and he fights every inch of ground so you don't have to baby them around. A real Christian fights for his position, even if it's alone. I know we seem to find uh, there, there's, a, there's a part of us that takes comfort in knowing that if we're wrong, there's a lot of other people who are wrong too. Right? It's kind of the whole principle that's built, McDonald's is built around. You know, four billion people served. Right? And you're like, well, numbers don't mean anything at that point. 
But there, there's, a, there's an idea, there's a psychology to the crowd. There's a psychology to knowing misery loves company. And, and, and I'm miserable where I am, but at least there's a lot of other people who are just as miserable as I am. And because, you know what, take someone with faith to say, I'm not happy being miserable in a crowd. I'd rather be happy and all alone. I'd rather fight for my position, stand alone with God, fight for every inch of ground so you don't have to baby them around. Brother Ram's talking, he's actually talking about coming to Phoenix to preach a meeting that Oral Roberts uh, wasn't able to come and preach. He was saying he was going to be taking the campaign on his own. Brother Ram says, I realize that every time faith sets itself up, the devil turns every gun in hell right on it like that. It's not going to be easy when you step forward to do something that God wants you to do. It's not going to be easy to apply the token to your home. It's not going to be easy to take the path that you feel that God is wanting you to take. But it's something worth fighting for. I'll try to run through this quickly. Just touch on a few scriptures here. He said, I'll drive them out, destroy their pictures, destroy their molten images, quite pluck down all their high places, dispossess the inhabitants of the land. But the man said they had to fight for every inch of ground. A Christian fights for his position. As soon as faith sets itself up, the devil turns every gun in hell on it, right like that. So when you come into the promised land, it's a place of fighting and war. So the book of Judges, there come a time when the children of Israel had to be reminded in Judges chapter 3, verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. They had stopped fighting. They didn't know what war was like. They didn't know what it was like to fight, but they still had to know. Teach them to war, to be trained in battle, to learn to engage in battle, not to run from, but to know what it looks like, to know what it feels like. Wage war, know how to use a weapon. Face the fight, don't run away. The Bible says in Exodus that the Lord is a man of war. This is... This is part of his essential characteristics. God is love. So God equals love, and God is a man of war, right? They say all's fair in love and war. Love is war. And some of us said, amen. But Lord is a man of war. He prepares his people for war. He he, he teaches them how to dress themselves for a fight. He, He teaches them how to handle a weapon. Brother Branham's drilling down on it. What would he give you armor for if he didn't want you to fight? What would he give you a sword for? So you can make fried green tomato sandwiches with it? It's one of the worst things to try to cut with a bad knife is a tomato. But he gives you a sword to fight. Psalms 144 verses 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. And though he's the subduer, though greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, there's still hands that need to be taught to fight and fingers how to fight. You've got to know how to fight in this. He's your goodness, your fortress, your high tower, your deliverer. He's your shield. He's the one in whom you're resting and trusting. But he's the same one that gives you strength and teaches your hands to war and your fingers to fight. I know some of you are thinking that that's this. Well, I'll I'll show them. All right. Two-thumbed warriors. Or maybe you just swipe, whatever it is. That's not what he's talking about. Brother Bram said in the message, greatest battle ever fought an army first is getting ready for a battle. First, it's got to select some soldiers. They got to be dressed for fighting. They got to be trained for fighting. It's a large thought there. And he says, and I believe that the greatest battle that ever was fought is now ready to go in action. I believe that God has been selecting his soldiers. I believe he's been dressing them, training them. And the battlefront is now set, getting ready to start. The greatest battle ever fought. In Psalms 1834, he teacheth my hands to war so that... A bow of steel is broken by my arms. He can teach you how to fight so that even a bow of steel is broken in your arms. He's dressing us for fighting and training us for fighting. The Lord, my strength, who teaches my hands to war and teaches my fingers to fight, he will teach my hands to war so that I can break a bow of steel. Brother, I'm continuing in the greatest battle ever fought. God's training for this great battle 
Matthew 24 and also Daniel 12, and there'd be a time of trouble such never like on the earth before. And we are living in that time when culture and education and things have smothered over the word of God and got into reasoning and so forth. The battle is now. Who will stand? Hallelujah. The battle's ready to go in. She's in array now. The battle is now. And he says, who will stand? He expresses it in other ways. Who will draw their swords with me? Who will, who will stand shoulder to shoulder? We're, 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 just maybe bear with me a little bit. I don't, I'm not necessarily getting into part two. But why is it so easy to fight against each other and we don't ever want to fight the devil? I know we're talking about the neighbors in the apartment next door. But think about it. Why is it so easy to go at one another and go toe-to-toe with another professed believer, but we never want to fight for the, the devil. We never, we never want to fight against unbelief. We don't want to ever fight against sin. We find it so easy to go at one another, but not stand shoulder-to-shoulder shoulder as we ought to and fight for things that are worth fighting for. So we may express on Sunday morning, putting our shoulder to the will to cry out against darkness. So the battle is now who will stand. I think I put the, those three things, but John, if you want to put them up, I'll read the quote, but just this is the gut check. Now let us all ch- tonight check our desires. Then you can see what kind of filter you've been drawing through. Let's check each one of us here and out across the nation. Check your desires, what you really want in life. Check what you're fighting for. Check what you're here for. Check what you go to church for. Oh, there's times in life when you're like, nope, mm-mm, right? You just, you don't want to fight. You don't want to have anything to do with it. You, you just, you back out of it. Nope. This is not the time. This is not the place. You know, you're, you're just kind of going through the grocery store and someone, someone you catch eyes with somebody. You look at me, like, nope, mm-mm. No, no, I'm blind actually. Where are you? Who was talking? Right? You don't want none of it. You're not, you don't want to fight. Listen. It's not going to work, Christian. It's not going to work, believer. He says, what are you here for? You you, you have to realize that whether you wanted one or not, you're in a fight. And you got to ask yourself, what am I fighting for? Am I fighting for the right thing? What am I here for? Where am I? What am I doing? And then even as he says, what are you going to church for? Uh, Are you just going to church? He says, it's fine to go to church, but that's not what saves you. It's gut check time. It's a time for us to to, to think about the principle. We're checking my desires, what I want in life. And if if I'm fighting, is it going to get me what really matters and what really counts? I shared just quickly with Sister Elizabeth on what I was preaching tonight. And she said, well, it's just like our family vision. And we have a kind of a family motto, a family saying that it's rapture or bust. That that's what we want. We, we want a rapture for our family. That's why we've made decisions that we've made in life. It's why we've traveled the road that we've traveled. Is we realize that if you want to make it to a grave, any road will get you there. If you just want to find yourself holding on in the end and, and, and living for a funeral, then just about any way will get you there. But if what you really want for yourself and for your family is a rapture, then you're going to have to make harder decisions. You're going to have to start fighting. You're going to have to pick up the sword. And I realize that if you want a body change, you're going to have to fight for it. You can't just lay around and just pretend it's going to happen. You have to make hard decisions and fight for it. And that's what I'm challenging you to do tonight. Fight for it. Fight for it. If you're fighting, what are you fighting for? You said, I'm just fighting. I'm just going through it. I'm just battling. What are you fighting for? Who are you fighting against? What's it all about? Fight for it. Is it, worth, is it something worth fighting for? You did that for that? You called them that because of that? And you fought them for that? And you did this? You did this and at the end of the yeah, just for that. When they're like, that's petty. All right. I think in a way that's kind of what Brother Bram's hitting at. Check your desires, what you really want in life. Brother Bram in two places is talking about going to war. He talks about his brothers that were in war. And he said if there's another war, he'd do it himself. He'd go to war himself. He said this is the greatest nation there is under the heavens. I'm glad to be an American. That's right. And if it's worth anything, it's worth fighting for. It's worth standing by. You're asking yourself, 
What am I fighting for? He says in another place, if this country ain't worth fighting for, it ain't worth living in. Think about that. If it's not worth fighting for, it's not worth living in. Is what you're living in worth fighting for? Ask yourself, if the condition you're living in, if the place you're living in, if the standard you're living at, if what you have isn't worth living in, is it worth fighting in? Because he says anything worth fighting for, if it ain't worth fighting for, it ain't worth living in. He said, well, I may be in a particular condition, but would you be willing to fight to stay in it? And if you're not willing to fight to stay in it, it's not worth it to stay there. So I'm challenging you as a believer tonight, if you're in a place that's not worth fighting for, fight to get out of it. Strive to find the place that you ought to be. Desire to get, find another level with God and say, Lord, I don't want to just lay around anymore. I just don't want to take it easy. If lifting me up into heavenly places means I've got to fight the devil, at least there I'll know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that's a place worth fighting for. Fight for it, saints. God bless you. Let's stand together.